All right, cool. So uh, welcome, everybody. This is the Jalen Bio series, and we're going to start with our episode one of podcasts. And uh, this series is about education as well as technology revolving around higher ed. And today we have a special guest and a special treat for everybody. This is Mr. Luis Vargas. He is currently an anatomy technology facilitator at the CHSU. This is the California Health Science University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, you've been there for a little bit over two years now, and uh, background, you went to UC Merced, and you were also a product of the California Community College System. And with that, I would like to welcome Mr. Luis Vargas, uh, the holo wizard, to our first episode. So, um, Luis, welcome. So, uh, how's it going? How's your week? Good. Week is going great. Almost Friday, so it's good. That's awesome. That's awesome. I know we're getting close to finals, right? So usually it's crunch time for a lot of folks and faculty and, and students are, are high stress. So we'll start us off by uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you do and, and what's your role at the CHSU. What is an anatomy technology facilitator? Yeah, so my main roles are based on a hardware and software support for students, faculty and staff. So hardware, including our Hall Lens 2 up here from Microsoft and then software, including OBMR from Gamard and um, hollow anatomy from Illumis. Um, so anything that involves those two aspects, I'm, I'm the guy for that. Yeah, it's really cool. And and I know uh, hollow anatomy is, and hollow lens is a, a new platform. Not everybody might be aware of this, but this is a, a virtual reality augmented platform, right? It's a, a by Microsoft and it's a headset where you wear it and you can display images. Um, so that's that's kind of a technology that definitely has been um, been fun. It's like the metaverse to some degree, right? The metaverse of of, uh, of learning. Um, cool. So let's uh, tell me how you got involved. So how did you get involved in your position? It sounds really cool. I'm sure there are people out there that might get into anatomy and like, hey, I want to do this. I mean, you know, maybe there's an opportunity. So yeah. So um, I was a pre med student at UC Merced, and I saw California Health Sciences was a new school developing. They were doing these kind of pre-med host. They were hosting these pre-med events and participating in them. I just knew that this technology was really awesome. I talked to the previous mixed reality specialist and I was like, hey, how do you do this? Like, this is a cool job itself. And he didn't have as much background in the sciences. He was more tech. Um, so then speaking to my old supervisor, Dr. K, um, kind of when I graduated, he reached out and he was like, hey, are you interested in doing something like this? And I said, Heck yeah, who doesn't want to work at a medical school? You know, who doesn't want to do this new technology that incorporates sciences and tech? So I was lucky enough to kind of um, just get in through him. And then I just learned a lot of it through the job. Um, the background in sciences was really helpful when connecting to kind of what do the students need from this? Um, and the tech I kind of learned on the job and having a mentor here at work, Ralph, um, it was just the perfect environment for me. Um, so that, that's pretty much how I, how I, um, you know, became part of the CHSU family. Yeah, that's really cool. It's one of those um, niche positions. Sometimes we don't realize it uh, during the undergrad. And as you're going through school, you don't really know that there's a position like this. And, and if you have the right skill set, you have the science background, you like technology and you're open minded, you might just fall into something that might open a door for you. So that's, that's really cool. And um, so far, uh, this is your second, a little bit over two years now at CHSU Com System. And how how are the uh, the folks you know faculty and, and students and staff and maybe even guests how do they approach the uh, whole device the whole lens system? Yeah, um, talk, talk compared to when I to, compared to when I first started, I think they're more comfortable um, just having someone who kind of can answer all their questions makes them more willing to use the device or learn how to operate it on their own. So I think that's been kind of uh, my favorite part of the job is making sure that that they feel like okay with focusing on their efforts. And if they need any any help on the software or hardware, hey Luis, I need help. So I like that part of kind of my job. And I've seen it develop in these first two years as I'm that guy to help them with any any kind of tech so that they can focus on creating the material so that our students are prepared for their complex or STEM exams. So that definitely has, has I've seen that growth from year one to two is um, learning the tech and being comfortable enough to teach anyone how to use it so that their their main goal is anatomy and not so much how do i fix this or i'm so stressed about the exam i have right. to worry about making sure it works right so yeah how do you how do you think yeah because you know the, the school is a 
the CHSU Medical School is fairly new, right? It's um, through its fourth year cohort. And, and when you think about it, it also was during a period of the pandemic, right? 2020, right? This was just a few years ago. I feel like a blink of an eye. But during that time, everybody was forced to go online, right? No matter how much you hated social media, you hate laptops and computers, and you just wanted to live a, a kind of a more simple lifestyle, you were forced to go online. Do you, do you think that the with adoption of this technology, or do you think it was something that's bound to happen? Um, it w it might have been bound to happen, but it was definitely the catalyst. I said, hey, we need this, yeah. and if you jumped on the boat, you were ahead. So CHSU, they jumped on the boat right away. They had these devices ready. They partnered with, with Case Western Reserve, now Illumis, and our first cohort had these devices at home running while our faculty were at home teaching them the lesson, and they were students were learning anatomy at the same time. So. Um, it was definitely uh, beneficial. We can say that uh, this tech being available to us kind of gave us that, uh, that heads up because now we're helping uh, new partners and being able to tell them our history and um, kind of what we learned uh, now that we've been on this tech for almost three years. Um, so, yeah, that was definitely um, a good and bad thing, right? COVID um, was, was, was bad in that aspect, but it was good for, um, for augmented reality and, and a 3D holographic anatomy. Yeah, it seems like it made a case because everybody wasn't able to be in person. And so having a digital platform, whether it be uh, in, a, in a video recorded format or maybe display format, it's always more accessible. Um, for all the listeners and, and viewers out there, in case they do not know what a hollow lens is, I noticed in the background of Lucas's office, he has one on display representing the hollow lens himself and the, the company Microsoft's product. But this is what a whole lens looks like. Um, Lewis, can you tell us a little bit, just describe to those that never, ever wore one before, how it feels, what's about, how do you use it? Very briefly, tell us a little bit of, of what that is. Yeah, so the best way to explain it is just it's a computer on your head, right? Um, once you put these lenses on, you can see the 3D um, holograms. Uh, there's cameras, sensors that are working constantly to kind of to collect data on the environment, on depth perception, and creating this spatial map around you. So it's, it's really complicated and really fun to wear. Um, there's like a dial here that'll fit to your exact head size. So I have a pretty, pretty big head. So it's nice <laughs> to know that it fits me. Um, yeah. But it's really comfortable compared to the first version of the HoloLens. This is okay. HoloLens 2. So compared to the first version, we can do stuff like this where we can take it off that easy. And there's a kind of forehead rest and it's yeah. much more user friendly. It also yeah. has, now it has um, eye tracking. Um, it has, uh, it takes voice. Uh, gestures and hand gestures compared to some of the VR headsets that have controllers. So yeah. it's much more advanced um, than the first version. And it's really lightweight compared to some of the other XR, VR headsets that I've worked with or seen. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And I think a lot of the users um, that do play with it notice that, it, you know, obviously this computer does have a little bit of a, of a weight to it, but it's not not that bad. You know, it's like almost wearing a helmet if you were right. riding a motorcycle or if you have like a attrition helmet on. Um, awesome. So what do you think as far as uh, using this HoloLens advice goes in an anatomy course? What are some, some challenges? Like, you know, are there any pushbacks and, and how does people that don't have a, a technology background or maybe digital literacy or maybe even a gaming background, you know, how do they embrace it? Yeah, it can be difficult for some of our students. Um, some of them that are not used to wearing a VR, AR headset will have trouble with, you know, getting headaches from their eyes going back and forth and having that eye strain. Right, it's not as heavy as VR, but it's still present. So some students don't like that. that aspect. Um, one thing that we found is some students not wearing it correctly, and they're wearing it nice and tight. And when I grab it, I'm like, "Whoa, you're giving yourself these headaches!" And they're like, "Oh, I just want it nice and snug." And I'm like, "Snug is this, tight is this." So it's a lot of teaching students to use it correctly so that they have the best experience and yeah. they're learning and not worrying about the device, but worrying about the material, and making sure our, our staff or our staff and faculty feel comfortable using it and asking for help when creating the slide work for them, right? Because our faculty already do so much work here. Part of my job is making sure that I can take some of that load off of them and then they can finalize the work, add any final features, and then focus on really teaching the material for our students. Right, right. That's, that's very good. And, and I think that's uh, where your role, your technology facilitator comes in and just being able to lend that hand when needed and, and provide that um, that delivery during the session, right? Because a lot of times technology will have issues, sometimes battery issues, connection issues, maybe um, I believe also for our, our device, we have to anchor, right? Anchor the, 
the hologram onto the certain surface and depending on the height of the room. So there's a lot of uh, small details that we have to, to work through. Um, what, as far as uh, using this device goes, do you think, uh, is there a certain grade or level of education that you think this is more appropriate? Is it good for, for K to 12 high school students or is it good for college or is it only really suited for medical students? What, what do you think? Yeah, as we see this new generation of learners, I'm even thinking we can start from maybe like fifth grade because of the price, <laughs> right? It's it's a really sure. like um, delicate device, so um, I think they can use it, but it's it's delicate equipment. So you know, trusting them to be careful with it is important. But I think as early as fifth grade, um, they're already using so much so much screens and are used to this type of touching around and feeling um, the environment. I've tried it with my cousins and they get on it really quick. I have a cousin in high school and he picked it up far quicker than like my aunt who is a, has an associate's degree and works in the IRS, right? Yeah. So I think with this new generation of, of learners, we can go all the way down to maybe like that middle school um, from high school and even as far as, you know, a, a PhD student or a medical student. Um, just depends on the software we're using because something like Hollow Anatomy, we can use on our medical um, students, but we can also use this for our high school students to teach them kind of um, the, the foundation of anatomy, right? Go over some more uh, simple kind of landmarks and stuff like that. So that when they reach the level of college or medical education, they're going to be more set and just need to add those additional structures. What What do you think? So, you know, there's always been a, a big debate, right? A lot of people will argue and talk about uh, when you're teaching anatomy, uh, there has to be a, a hands-on a physical kinesthetic component where you got to be able to feel, you got to be able to smell, you got to be able to, to fully see the depth uh, of a model. Uh, what would you say to those people that, that say, well, hey, hollow anatomy is great, but we, I can't smell anything or mm -hmm. I can't touch anything, right? I can see it, but I can't touch it. So how would you kind of encourage those people to maybe have an open mind to maybe try? I would definitely agree with them and tell them you're, you're right. I mean, Part of uh, learning is uh, understanding that there's different types of learners, right? Some of us need that tactile hands-on. Um, with this device, it was mainly um, geared towards mixed reality. So having both, having the hologram over a cadaver even, right? So you can see both at the same time. Something that we're seeing now is haptics, being able to maybe wear a suit um, or have some types of smells that will associate kind of learning, right? Because we learn through stress a lot. So that's something that I would say, you're right. We do need that hands-on feel, but this is enough to kind of show you where things are um, because we do have our faculty that come in here or our preceptors who went through medical school. And a lot of what they're saying is, I wish I had this for my first year. I don't really, I didn't really need a touch cadaver until maybe my, my surgical rotation or even at all. So having that type of communication, hearing that from them really assures me that our students do have the equipment I would really love to see them touch a cadaver at least once or twice um, just so they kind of know and kind of see and visualize and respect that body for what it is. But even then, the hollow, hollow lens too with hollow anatomy is enough for our learners. And through what we've seen with our, with our third and fourth years who are taking these exams, they're doing well in their anatomy, right? So we know it, it does have some impact and it is working. Right. No, I, I actually would agree is that, you know, after uh, as well, my background being able to teach anatomy physio for so many years is that at this level, there always is a requirement that students need to know uh, the map and the map is the body, know the structures, know the, how things connect and know some of the landmarks. And that part really doesn't require you to see a cadaver, right? When you see a cadaver, you're going to see all shapes and, and sizes and all ethnicities and genders. And so having a, a solid, clear roadmap to begin with as your foundation might actually benefit them as they layer on. And plus, I think when I was first introduced to the whole lens, I believe the uh, the power is that it gives every student the chance to see the same thing, right? You're not going to have uh, students not able to access one component of a cadaver or a model, and then everybody gets the same exact um, accessibility. So that's really cool. How do you see this um, evolving? Like, you know, this has been been a year or a few years in the making now, and, and you're, you're two years in what do you see down the road like another two or three years is are we going to have to get new devices is there going to be components we can add on to it is it built to have upgrades or is it just something that has to be re uh, repurchased you know like computers and, and iphones you know every every year a new iphone comes out right and i don't know how how many years it takes for a, a hololens to come out but um what's your thoughts and any anything you want to share i definitely um 
I definitely think there's going to be either a Holland's 2 Plus or a 3, just because I've been talking to some of the, the ex-Microsoft engineers and they've been telling me that, that they really want to focus on the optics, the lenses, the power, and there's pros and cons to that, right? The more power we have, does that mean less battery life? Does that mean we're going to be tethered to something? Which we <laughs> don't really want, right? We want to be able to move around back and yeah. forth. So there's some pros and cons to the device. Because it's so lightweight, it means that we can do things like move around, have a longer battery life, but maybe the graphics aren't where we want them. So I think there is um, future works of maybe developing a stronger chip for something like this that's so lightweight. Um, but even then, we've been getting OS updates from Microsoft that are improving some form of that hologram and stability and creating better spatial mapping. But I do I do see another upgrade, another HoloLens um, upgrade coming maybe within the next two or three years. And with the release of that Apple Vision Pro, that might be a little bit sooner, right? Apple and Microsoft and their little, you know, fun composition. Um, even though that's for um, that's not for industrial um, use. It could be something that sparks, you know, Microsoft attention and they say, hey, we might need to update this really quick. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where I see it going for sure. It almost seems like uh, we want the uh, the Neuralink from Elon to to get things going, right? There's this brain chip or this implant. And then we also have all these uh, digital devices like an Apple Watch and everybody has an iPhone now. And, and it's, it's just so powerful. And then now we have this whole lens, you know, is there a way to to connect them, right? Is there a way to kind of simplify the connection of all the devices and make it just one item that we can all wear, everybody gets to use it. I mean, some of us wear glasses, prescription glasses, and I have them on 24 hours, almost, you know, every day, all day. Uh, I'll sleep with them sometimes, I'll just, you know, fall, they'll fall right off sometimes, but it's uh, it's a, almost a part of our body now, right? So I think uh, th these are probably the early stages of bring technology into our classrooms and almost replace some of the older approaches to pedagogy, right? So right now, uh, could you tell us a little bit as far as the anatomy courses go at CHSU, is, is there a real high emphasis on models or is that more supplementary or is HoloLens the bread and butter of, of the program? It seems like it is HoloLens being that, that main bread and butter. We do have some models here. We don't test with the models. So that's one of the things that might be the reason why hollow anatomy is so vast here is because we test with these devices on. So every practical, as you know, for every block, we have maybe 10 to 16 questions, depending on how much we use the device, mm -hmm. um, using, you know, that hollow lens too. Um, and then we have some stuff that we can show on the hall and like histology, pathology, physio, kind of these microscopic images we can't really show, right? So then it's half of the exam being that aspect and the half being gross anatomy. So here I think it's, it's mostly geared towards this lens and this device. Um, but we do have like you know those models sometimes students will check them out but it's not we don't have that many models or, or as um, as good as we want them for our students to constantly be checking them out so i guess one of the, the questions i'm sure people that do come across this video or if they ever do listen to this podcast they're probably going to be thinking you know how much does this actually cost right for maybe some schools or programs or maybe a, a college and they have an anatomy lab and maybe they want to acquire a few of these systems what what kind of numbers are we looking at for getting first of all the software right the software to to use and also the hardware right and also any accessories that go with it so charging ports maybe like a case what what's like an average cost for one device with with a set of uh, software yeah so the hardware itself including charger including the brow pad including all the all the components that you need um, that's just going to cut you at 3500 brand new. It comes with a one-year warranty, so you're safe for a year to, you know, do it if you really get mad, you know, mess with it, get really intense. Um, and then including the software, we have a licensing with Illumis, our partner. So um, if you were to buy it through us and be one of our students and want a brand new lens for yourself, it would be about 4000 okay. right? So usually what schools do is they, ne they negotiate with uh, Loomis, they find out what kind of contract they want to do, and it can be anything for like maybe 10000 for a year, anything increasing, and it depends on the apps, right? So if you're just talking about the Hollow Anatomy app, it might be at that price range, but if you want to do another app like the new Neural Anatomy app, that might have to increase, but it just depends on, on what your school needs. But uh, Nancy Farrow and Chad, who are our partners when it comes to anything Hollow Anatomy related, have been really great with us. Um, they constantly work with our partners and connect us all to give us any updates on the software or any issues that everyone else has been having about kind of the soft or the, the hardware of the HoloLens too. That's impressive. I know um, from my experience also with, with using the devices that there's always ongoing changes. It's very organic. A lot of new additions, updates coming in. 
it almost feels like when you when you have too many updates it might be kind of a chore right you start thinking oh are there all these issues that you're trying to fix but at the same time that means they're addressing it so which is good they're, they're always having updates and uh, very much like video games where they have an, another patch or they have another dlc right. another upgrade you know so that way you have new content to come in so that's really cool um as far as the hollands goes and, and really related to this this is kind of a broad question how do you feel about any other kind of technology coming in i mean i'm sure you've uh, been involved with um with ed tech now with conferences looking around shopping around seeing what's the uh the newest the greatest and the most effective what do you think is um is on the horizon or or maybe if a hollow lens is are they creating something in the background that you don't know about yeah so i love this question we i went to imish um in january and imish is this conference for uh simulated healthcare and it's like it's like a candy shop for me all these technologies are out there vr xr ar nice. um, all the r's you can think of right yeah. um and it's just it was like mind-blowing to see what's next um one thing that i for sure um remembered was the tesla suit so the tesla suit incorporates vr with this uh tesla suit that you wear it's really tight it involves haptics so i was um I put it on i was able to kind of stop the bleed on a patient in like a like a warfare scenario so i came up to the patient i was communicating with them i was wow. feeling gunshots around me i was feeling the ground shaking so wow. in that moment i was kind of remembering it because of all the stress of i have to stop this bleed so kind of what are the steps right yeah, yeah. Bleed. Wow. and then how do i manipulate uh, and move things around the environment to save this patient while they're talking to me and while my body's feeling all these senses. So that's one of the things that um, um, I really remember as to where uh, AR is moving towards. Um, a lot of companies are doing, uh, now that Hollow Anatomy is like one of the, the kind of, I would say maybe top three uh, uh, 3D anatomy apps, we've seen, we're seeing more uh, engineers create their own applications like Anatomy X, um, we're talking gig xr we're talking tool tech that are trying to create their own software that connects to lms and connects to multiple devices right so hollow anatomy being on your laptop being on your phone being yeah. on the screen so that students can not only view it on the hololens but on different platforms so right right okay yeah that, that's really impressive i think when you said the body suit one of the pieces of creating a very really realistic experience and train those fond memories and long-term memories for students is knowing knowing the environment right having that moment of, of understanding like you said the stimulus the stress coming into the body and, and those memories whether they are very traumatic or very stressful they, they will stick they'll stick in in, in your long-term memory and so i think that's really powerful that's that's amazing um as far as uh the hollands goes um have you noticed any uh in, in your experience any anything that you just don't think is working you know i mean we've talked a lot about the good you know we always, always want to play the devil's advocate and play the bad side as well so what are some things that are not you know doing well or, or stuff that isn't you know up to par because I'm, I'm sure as you're playing around you'll realize little, little gimmicks and things that you just feel like hey you know this is poor design or maybe something that wasn't created uh with, with that suit intent for me it's definitely the the hologram instability um, it's mm -hmm. definitely improved because i've been able to i've been doing it for a while now so it's improved but even then i feel like within these two years if it, it could have jumped a lot greater so that's something that I constantly are talking to these Microsoft engineers whenever I send out tickets and whenever we're on calls. I'm like, what does it take for this hologram instability to go away? Um, I know it's our environments are getting better. Our the spatial mapping is getting better. The depth perception on these on these cameras are getting better and sensors. So I know that it's going to take a while. And like I said, um, if we increase the power of the device, what does that mean? Are we going to get a bigger device? Are we going to be tethered? So I know there's, you know, there's uh, giveaways. Um, so I'm hoping that they can create something that's still lightweight enough and can still improve this kind of hologram shifting for our students. Because that's, that's mainly their complaint is that all the hologram moves a lot. And a lot of it's either we need to calibrate it for their eyes. But sometimes when we fully do the works on the device, it still shows some instability. And our students kind of, they demand perfection, right? Yeah. So um, that's one of the things that we're still fighting on about is how can we improve this device and not lose what we have um, and improve that hologram and stability to make sure it's kind of good um, the, the the graphics are as best as they, as they can be it, all, it almost feels like that when you think about the device itself you have a computer and just like any laptop or, or iphone right there's always going to be chip upgrades there's hardware upgrades maybe a gpu some kind of 
processing unit that has to be in there. And it's hard because if you look at the HoloLens, uh, is the computer in the back or is it in the front? It's right here's the back. Right, there, right. So that, that that's it. That's basically the size of your iPhone. And so that piece itself has to have all the chips and all the all the little signals to be able to hot pr produce a high resolution to be able to create the shading, the lighting, um, maybe a battery pack somewhere in there as well. So I mean, when you think about a computer, right, you got to have a, a motherboard, some kind of a GPU, a CPU, and then a power supply. And so those components have to be shrunk into a hall lens. So it's definitely a, more of a, I think a hard, it looks like a hardware uh, piece as well. Definitely. Really cool. Yeah. And, um, great, great discussion here. So what do you think as far as uh, moving forward? So, so moving from today and, and we're in almost at the end of 2023 now, when 2024 is right next door, uh, how do you see uh, this device being implemented, you know, next year, just, just immediately, what are some of the changes that you, you will, you will expect coming in for the next couple of months? I definitely think it being used more in other classes besides, besides our labs. Okay. Something that we've been seeing slowly is it being used in OPP to review like neck vasculature, right? Or being used in TDP to review female and male repro before doing those techniques on our SPs or our advanced mannequin model. So mm -hmm. I definitely um, I see this being used more in class where our students are constantly on it, but it kind of takes some work with myself and some of our other faculty and specialty medicine to say, hey, we have this work. Um, I can I can create this for you. Can you review it? And are you okay with using this in your class as an anatomy review before we go on and do those hands-on techniques? And even something for like medical Spanish, um, something that I've been trying to get into is having this device being used for some of those anatomical terms in Spanish where students have another modality besides the PowerPoint and the lecture. So be, I, de I definitely think it's it's a lot of work between myself and our faculty to kind of create that, that um, relationship and trust within each other to use this device more often in those classes. So what uh, is, is there any uh, recreational component of HoloLens? So let's say if the students have it, we use it for, for the anatomy platform and for assessment and for learning. Is there any recreational side? Is there a gaming component? Is there any kind of uh, simulation that, that you could play with on the device? Any, anything fun that, that could be done on this? Headset? Yes, definitely. This is a computer on your head, right? So you can download any apps you want, any games on it. Our students um, I would say maybe out of 100, maybe three of them might get creative because they already do so much. Unless you have a gaming background, you're just like, all right, no thanks. I have other things to focus on. But yeah. there are apps that I recommend to students who I recommend because of the way the game is, it helps you with those hand gestures. It helps you with moving around the spatial environment. So I definitely do recommend some games on there. Um, right now we have our devices locked, um, but we're going to be opening up. Uh, in the next semester because we, we're going to be using two applications. So I'm going to be recommending some games on there. Hey, play with this. Check this out on your free time, which, you know, they have a lot of, right, our medical students. So, yeah, um, yeah it's it's definitely, it can be used for gaming as well. It's just that it's more of an industrial device. So yeah. it's not re it's not really pushed towards gaming. But I, I've done creative on there and, and created some, some maps myself and messed around with some pretty cool games. You know, I, I think that's actually really good because um, we don't want to invade on the gaming industry as well or, or maybe take over. And this is a, a niche, right? It's a, it's a platform that creates a, almost a, not, I wouldn't say a, a complete replacement, but definitely an alternative to uh, learning anatomy. And, and of course, you know, the device has to be, be improving. Um, you know, last question related to the HoloLens is what's one wish that you could do um, with that device? So what is one, one thing you would hope that this could uh, do? Um, maybe are you are you able to watch a movie on there are you able to watch like uh, videos um, i know it has a camera function what, what other cool functions does it have yeah i mean it like you said it has a camera for video and audio um it you can watch you can watch movies you can watch videos um because it's such a um kind of smaller device the rate on there the speeds of gig kind of going through are slow right so if you watch a youtube video it might be a little slower than usual i try to send emails on here and those take a little while Right, so um, I would just want to maybe have have a stronger chip on there so I can do some work on the device, right? I can connect my Bluetooth keyboard. I don't need my laptop. I just wear it all day and can send emails. I can do my work on there, maybe create create hollow anatomy material on my HoloLens too. So I would kind of wish for that, but that's, that's pretty that's pretty stretched enough. That's, that's a far stretch out there just because our computer here is a lot stronger than the computer there. So. So yeah, that, that's on my wish list, but it's uh, it's pretty out there. 
That's cool. That's cool. And and and, uh, and I guess you know that that kind of uh, wraps up our, our talk on the whole lens part. So the, the next couple of questions just kind of relate to how, how things are going for you and and as a as an individual and as a maybe your career and your trajectory. How do you see this benefiting you? So having these kind of tools. And, and knowing this technology, being able to adapt and be flexible, um, where do you see yourself going forward? You know, and I know you're, uh, you know, you you graduated uh, at UC Merced, you you started working at, at the uh, CHSU Medical School, and wh where do you want to go? Yeah, so I think being in this environment has one of the best gifts um, I've received. Um, not because of just uh, the opportunity to work with this tech, but being in an environment where I see myself in. You know, being able to learn from our medical students and create relationships with them and see the variety of student learners we have and understand this is adult learning and not, you know, uh, young adult or kind of um, adolescent learning. So it's a different level. It's like they always say here, it's like a, a fire hose kind of just spouting at you, right? So a lot of information at once. So yeah. being here in this environment has really helped me kind of um, accept that this is what I want to do. And no matter how hard it gets, and having these conversations with them, I know it gets hard. So I know that this is kind of in my future. Working with this tech uh, has kind of inspired me to not just be a physician, but to be a physician in simulation, right? Be a, be a mentor to students and use this technology to, to teach the next um, crop of doctors out there, teach the next generation. So um, this job has done a lot for me and it's, it's still, it still teaches me new things, um, even though I've been here for, for a while. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's always, it sounds like you're always willing to learn and adapt and that's really impressive. That's one of those, those uh, toolkits, you know, that you want to have and technology is going to change. I mean, give it a few years, it'll probably be something newer, something faster, something more creative. And so it's really the ability to process information. So what are your hobbies, uh, Luis? Uh, what's your pastimes? What do you do when you're not wearing the HoloLens? I'm assuming you're wearing it 24 hours a day and walking around. So what are you doing when you're taking off the helmet? Or the yeah. When I finally take it off, you know, um, I'm spending time with my family. I have a big family. I'm a second older brother. Um, I'm two boys and five girls, so you know they're they're my uh, they're my motivation. You know, um, I like to weight lift like you. You know, the bodybuilder that you are. I try to emulate that and, and get up there. So um, I love playing sports, soccer, volleyball. Even though I had surgery uh, in February, you know, sports is something that has driven me and kept me up and healthy. And then spending time with my, my friends or, or my, my brothers, right, um, and sisters. But, but yeah, that's my family, man. I love sports and um, tech. You know, how, how good does it get? I know. Tech is tech is definitely, uh, you know, right. Hate or love it, right? You got to embrace it now. It's everywhere in every, every aspect of our lives. Uh, who's one person that you admire the most, dead or alive? Wow. That I admire. Yeah. Right now, it would have to be probably my mentor, Ralph. Um, I mean, you met Ralph himself. Um, I think he's really helped me get out of my shelf and grow and develop as kind of a man and then as a brown man in STEM. Um, you know, him being a paramedic and him being a, sim a simulation specialist and an assistant manager and kind of taking those steps in a field that's predominantly kind of white um, has kind of given me the confidence to, to be okay in my skin and be okay in an environment like this where I don't see a lot of Latinos. Um, so he's been kind of that guy who's been pushing me when I feel like, oh, I'm getting comfortable here. He's like, no, you have much more work left. Get out there, go fail, go learn. So he's definitely someone I admire, especially within these last two years of, of being a, a professional, um, you know, being out of college. It's a, it's a big difference. I, I think that's actually really powerful. And, and that's actually a good way to steer our, our talk is that, you know, when you think about CERN, uh, fields of study and certain certain industries and maybe certain cities, certain states, certain areas, certain countries. Diversity is a very beautiful aspect of, of our society, right? Diversity, having different ideas, having different people come in with different skill sets. But there are some fields that are more saturated. And, and when you're sitting there in a room in a meeting and, and you, you tend to stand out a little bit, maybe whether it be your skin color, your, your, your attire, your background, those can all make you hold back and reduce confidence, right? That can also affect your performance to some degree. And I am also uh, very, very aware of what you're just speaking of. And, and I, I've also been part of the system as well. So I think a lot of it has to do with being able to be confident in yourself, uh, train hard, right? Study hard, make sure that to know what you bring to the table and that know that, you know, there's there's going to be a, a level playing field for everybody. Everybody has the opportunity. Everybody has 24 hours in a day. You know, nobody else that you're going to meet in this world is going to have one more extra hour, right? And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. Um, that's good. So what's one of the uh, most important lessons you would say 
uh, other than saying motivated that, that you kind of would share to all the all the minority listeners and folks that are maybe sitting in a meeting right now uh, being a little bit different or standing out in that group what would you say I'd definitely say um find discipline early right like you said you need to work when you don't want to you know saturdays take advantage of them like like me and lynn right we're in there on saturday working learning yeah we're grinding discipline just be okay with being uncomfortable is yeah. the best advice and then finding a mentor to someone who knows who you are who looks like you who's been through similar backgrounds who's made it and it kind of helps you kind of give you that reassurance of you know they made it i can too um yeah. find that good mentor and then even mentoring someone who might give you that you know like, oh you're like wow someone's really coming to, for, for, to me for help like i must have done something right it kind of helps with that imposter syndrome and um kind of pushes pushes you to make them proud and strive for greatness so definitely yeah you know, no I, I agree i think the imposter syndrome is really real and, and a lot of us uh, whether or not you admit it or whether or not you face it we all have a little bit of that what, what do you think is one of the proudest moments that you can share Ooh, proudest moments. Um, I think when I went to Colombia in August, I went for a global medical trip. And I think just people coming to me and asking me for help and trusting what I had to say was like, wow, like, why don't I trust myself, you know? And I kind of, I was proud of, of how far I've come and the work that I was doing in that area. So that was definitely like, wow, like, I'm good. I can do this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was definitely it. it. Was amazing when I went to Colombia. I got to you know speak my Spanish and do my my medical service over there. Um, and I really I really found myself over there and kind of finally got had the confidence that I've been kind of searching for these these past you know four or five years. That's cool. Awesome. Well, I guess Lewis, that that wraps it up. You know, for our talk and you know appreciate the time. Um, I'm gonna pause the report right now. We're good. But